Hey everyone, this is Tom, and this week's character is Aless for Jacob, but instead of it being done by me, it was done by uh, Matt Rhodes, who's sitting right here with me, and he'll introduce himself. Hey, yeah, that's right. It's uh, good to be back. Um, for anybody who is uh, who didn't see me come in last time, uh, my name is Matt Rhodes, I'm Tom's brother, and I'm currently a lead concept artist at the video game company Bioware. Well, thanks for doing this this week, Matt. It really it's nice it's nice to have a fresh set of eyes work on something and and to show people a different approach to things, whether it's stylistically or uh, like technique in a technical sense. And and it's good for other people. It's good for me. Like I learn a lot from you, and I'm sure other people are excited to see how uh, a, a pro actually does it. Um, well, and this is kind of a good challenge in that in that it's not it's not comparable by any means. But when comedians go on stage. To practice stuff and they just say you just got to keep going on stage this is a good way of putting yourself to the test and giving yourself some restrictions and, and something really hard to try to bite into yeah and making sure that it still works because if if you get to the point where you're just drawing for yourself yourself or you're getting away with too much at work because they like you too much uh, then you can start to atrophy or rely on the same things too often and it's nice to like have to throw down this way, I think. Well, and honestly, that's why this time I came to you, because I, I was sitting there, uh, I, I had a bit of time to draw at home, and I, I realized I was just kind of relying on the same old things. Mm. I thought, hey, did, let's let's try another one of these, because it would be good to have a very specific set of, of, of uh, constraints from something. Yeah, and it's like we always said as kids to each other, is what should I draw? Yep, and you over and over and over again. All the time. <laughs> But now, like, I, hey I, Tom, don't like, say it. Don't say it. What it's like if I, I ask know? if I ask you and you tell me something, I'll be like, typical. Like, I mean, <laughs> it's totally some, the sort of thing you would say. But mm -hmm. this is great because there's so many people out there with, and every character is fresh and distinct, and and it's just and and they're they're, they're actually counting on you to finish it too. So you have to do it. You I know. Yeah. You yeah. can't just give up and be like, oh, I tried. But uh, I think I probably would have given up on this about two or three times. <clears throat> In the process, yeah, that's that's how I feel probably every minute when I work on <laughs> these. Is like I sometimes I'm just like I know that I would give up so many times, mm -hmm. but because I have I've committed to it, I go through and and it, it helps a lot. But uh, um, as as far as this goes, I mean you've already you've already started working a totally different way than I do, like with a lot more exploration and stuff. So why don't you just explain to Anybody who wouldn't know what you're doing here, like how you've been going about stuff. Yeah, well, I think more and more, the the more that I draw, the more important, the more vital, the more central, I think, the pose is. Mm. Um, and there's there's something about even just the line of action of a character that's kind of like, it, it is their story. It tells, it talks about, it says everything about who they are, how they hold themselves. A single line should be able to tell you something about a character mm. and so uh, with this pretty early on I kind of wanted to, to try a few things just to get a pose right um, what I what I ended up settling on uh, this character Ellis uh, it was a really concise description which was great Jacob was was very on point with it and one of the things is he's a half elf um, but he really leans toward he prefers his elven side and he actually it kind of tries to downplay his human side mm. Um, and he's also one of the factors in his upbringing and his training was as a charlatan like performing card tricks and things like that in order to distract people so that you know they could pickpocket them and so between those those two things seem kind of big hmm. and as much as I was playing with with poses I kind of just tried to do literally both of those things one with each arm so one is uh, he's he, he has a description of having shoulder length hair but the idea of him pulling that back around his ears on a regular basis just constantly he would just sort of develop this habit of pulling the hair back around his ears just to really just show off that elvenness oh yeah um and then the other hand just doing kind of like mid card trick kind of flipping things around and cool showing things off yeah i like the the hand behind the ear that's a good thing like a tick like uh i remember like i used to when i had long hair in college and i got it cut i would still like for for a few months afterwards i would still like <laughs> flick my hair yeah, back exactly. to get it in the light or like when uh this anecdote I heard about an astronaut that came down from the ISS and for like half a year uh, he'd be sitting at his desk and when he was done writing something he would just like hold his pen up and let go because he was so used to it just, <laughs> just staying, staying there. there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That sort of thing. It's, it's cool to include like ticks like that into a character. Actually this part uh, I was almost nervous of just know knowing that you would be watching this. Um, I was just getting frustrated with the hips. The hip, the hip area is still something I'm wrestling with, mm -hmm. and I wasn't happy with it. So here, I just really tried to get in and get 
nitty gritty with it. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think about what is, okay, contrapasto, the hips off to the side and one knee forward, one knee back. How do all the muscles connect? Um, still not totally happy with it, but <laughs> I, it's at least something to work with. Yeah. And that's a, a big part of like why I, uh, like why I, I do it. Um, it, like even like from the get go, like I've, I've been doing it less because I just sort of want to like ride without my training wheels on for mm -hmm. a bit and see how it sticks. But just starting from the get go, just have just rem even rem having it down to a system where there's a few lines you can draw to remember where stuff goes, and because oftentimes I'll draw and I'll draw and I'll draw and it'll just not be working until I just it, like sit there and admit like okay, I'll mm -hmm. go back and do it the the hard way, and so I just kind of try to do that first. Yeah. At least get do it that way, and then you know, well, exactly. play it, play it out from you know, just learn what I need to learn. Exactly. Yeah. And here I was trying to give him a kind of a he's mid conversation. He's a talker first and foremost. Hmm. And I wasn't happy with those eyes, so I redrew them. Much happier with them. Actually, even later on, the way his face was drawn here, I tried a few different attempts, and when I go to the the, the next level up of inking. Hmm. I changed it and then wasn't happy with it. I literally just took these eyes and brought them back up. Hmm, nice. Into the final. Sometimes when you just go in quickly, you, you draw the right thing. <laughs> yeah. If you know, yeah, it's it's almost like it feels like beginner's luck mm -hmm. or so. Um, but yeah, you 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 usually is this like similar how you work day to day? Oh yeah, re oh, very much so. Um, like even just up there having the 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 fast and dirty sketch. Yeah. Um, it kind of helps to keep you grounded. I, I like to, I have to work messy first um, and just keep going back to my notes here and there just to make sure I'm getting everything and putting everything in context. Um, but yeah, so so working working fast and dirty and then a slight, slight more, slightly more refinement, then a little bit more still, then a little bit more still mm. until it's, it's, I'm ready to do the, uh, the final kind of line work inking pass. Mm. But the, I, I still try to keep a little bit of fun for that last pass. Like I try, try not to draw everything too specific, still keep things somewhat vague. It's almost like the sketch becomes the notes. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. There's like, it's just little anchors for like what to remember and what to include, you know, yeah, as, long, really as long as it's not like something with a lot of structure and volume, like a hand or a face or mm -hmm. a gun or something, uh, it's just enough to be like, okay, remember this has to be here, but you know, when, when you're there, like don't commit to anything now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, in this guy, I, actually, one thing I, I could talk about with this character uh, that was kind of cool was that sometimes with characters, there's um, there's a lot of deep backstory. There's a lot of um, tension or there's something hidden or, or things like that, mm -hmm. that as an artist, it's fun to try to hint at or to imply. Mm -hmm. But the kind of cool thing about the character of Ellis is that Jacob's got him. He has some interesting stuff in his past, um, like his, his father disappeared when he was younger. Um, his mom raised him until he was five, and then, and then he was raised basically as a, as a, uh, an orphan pickpocket, charlatan, um, thief, uh, for the rest of for the remainder of his life. And now he's kind of on a search for his father. Mm. That stuff's cool, but you get the the impression from his write up that he's also kind of fine. Like he he's not he's not tortured about it. Mm. He would like to find his father. He's learning about his past, but it's not like oh, what is my who am I? What's going on? And so <laughs> yeah, he's not like Batman. He can actually like get over it. Yeah. Right. So it, it it was kind of fun in that sense. Where uh, as cool as the stuff, some of that stuff in his past is, he really is just a kind of flashy, charming blabber mouth of a thief yeah <laughs> and so it, it, so he's very much it was it was kind of about drawing the surface material mm. um, which was cool so there was a pretty specific list of uh, items and and you know weapons and outfits and, and and things like that trying to kind of knit them all together yeah it could be I think it could be said that like the higher uh, like or the, the more charisma a character has the less about their true nature could be yeah, yeah. Visibly, well, least. and there, there's a, there's an element of this character too that he likes disguise. Mm -hmm. um, he, he's and he as they in one of his past missions, they performed an opera for a corpse. No, for a ghost. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> they, they performed an opera and it kind of got them something special. So there's a there's that element of performance and mm -hmm. and putting on a show. Okay, now these are weird. This is the weirdest I got. The boots. He has boots of springing. 
And my goofy little idea was that it would be boots that had all these straps and um, uh, uh, basically like bracers. It's almost like taking the same wood you would use in a bow and stringing them through the boots. Mm. So it just, it's a little bit of extra spring and push for when you take those big leaps. Mechanically feasible, that it, beneficial. I'm, look, I'm looking at it and it looks believable. Like it, it's almost like um, it's a little bit defense. Like a, it's a little bit. Yeah, like you could kick or block a sword or something with it, but it. I mean, it looks like it lines up. It remind. It's like a hybrid of or like an overlaying of the Paralympic sprinter leg. Well, that's what I exactly. Around the yeah. Front. Yeah. Yeah. I want okay cosplayers go build this thing. <laughs> tell me if this works <laughs> get back to it it <laughs> looks if, like it does and if any of these sticks go shooting through your thighs or something like that when you should da sit down then uh, don't yeah you didn't hear it from us so no. I'll delete the video <laughs> I can't prove it <clears throat> well that's a cool idea I mean typically that would be like something like magical and I would just be like uh, just make a neat looking boot and just you know it's enchanted mm -hmm. uh, it's magic I don't gotta explain anything but that's a cool route to take, because, like, it physically, visibly feasible. Well, and, and I, it, it's funny, too, because now I just realized I kind of <clears throat> went the opposite, because the one area where you would go crazy, maybe technical, is he has on, on the bottom of it his left arm there with the cards. Yeah. He has a goblin fire-breathing device gauntlet thing. Um, hmm. And I kind of made that almost more magical. Like, there's a... A little fuel canister there with two, two, two uh, barrels. Mm. Um, very, very, very simple. Um, no explanation. <laughs> not, much, not much detail there. Um, but the boots, I had a lot of fun with. Yeah. And what's with his uh, his other gauntlet with the scales thing? <coughs> so that is a. He has a set of blue dragon gloves, mm. dragon scale gloves, and uh, so I was thinking, I could imagine being. In a fantasy setting, if you're going to make dragon scale gloves, the idea of preserving as much of the dragon as possible. Mm. Uh, so putting your hand through there, and I, I like the he has a he's a really high dexterity character. So kind of like with the last one I did, uh, it's just keeping the fingers free, mm -hmm. but preserving the claws so that they still have this kind of like you know he makes a fist and it, it it's making claws, but then he can still do all of that detail work and pickpocket and do whatever he needs to do. Yeah, it'd be hard to reach into a pocket if he had big barbed knuckles. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's a it's a challenge, but yeah. Um, and then to yeah, this is I once like this is starting up the inking layer. Um, where it's kind of like the final drawing, essentially, or the final drawing aspect of it. Yeah. Um, and I just, he just looked a, just a bit shittier. Like, just, not like, just as a, he looked like a bit of a shittier person somehow. I don't know. It's like like the, after doing this? Yeah, like the layer underneath, if I flash between it, there's something about the eyes that I drew the first <clears> time that just look a little kinder and warmer. I, a little bit more in keeping with that character. I'd have to look back and see, but... I'll, I'll redraw them and then you'll... Yeah, I, later on I, I just go in and redraw them. Oh, okay. After Great. I get to the... After I start adding color. Well, that's like the paradox, or the curse of inking, is mm -hmm. when, when you have a sketch and you have all this... It's almost like quantum art, where, like, you have all of these, like, in, like, all these possible lines and your brain just is interpreting which one you like the most mm -hmm. as being the real one, but then once you actually have to, like decide on where this if the, is this line a particle or a wave <laughs> collapsing waveforms as you go <laughs> yeah then you're committed to one thing and it and it even when you're the person drawing it it's not the one that you saw mm -hmm. yeah never never and I, I don't know how to get around that other than just leaving it to pass or just like letting it happen and just being like you know what it's out of my control. Just well, I'm just gonna figure out a way to ink that looks good and just yeah. Go. I think I think a big element of it is just get it out there, because I, I I feel like now I've done enough drawings. Um, actually, the last personal thing I did was a piece of mist fan art, and um, there's a lot of stuff in there I don't like. It was an experiment, but just letting it sit in my dry on my computer for a while mm. and not set, setting it just doesn't feel that useful. So it's like okay, just put that out. Once it's out, then I can't change it. I can't um, Lucas it, and and like go back and re redo it and send mm -hmm. send it out again. And so it just forces you to say, okay, well, I don't want to let that particular thing happen again. 
so I'm going to pay more attention next time, or I'm not going to do that technique, or I'm going to, I don't know, it's like keeping yourself accountable. Mm. Yeah, just like committing to it. It's like, yeah. if it's if it's bad now, people are going to think it's bad in different ways than I do, and it's, it's going to be bad now, yeah. and forever, and I'll just improve anyway, so what's the big, what's the big idea? Because mm-hmm. even if you put something up that you like... You're gonna think it's bad in a few months anyway. Yeah. Or like you'll you'll be able to pick it apart mm-hmm. as you go. So just put stuff up. Just get stuff out there. Like even to like a younger artist, um, just making things and putting them out there, not worrying about if people will like it. Don't worry about people overanalyzing stuff. Even though all these videos are about me overanalyzing stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we well, you know it ties into what you said earlier, actually, about finishing. I was going to mention this when you were talking about finishing something. I think finished is one of the best qualities any piece of art can possibly have. That if it's just done and out, if if you can finish stuff, that's the that's where the real learning comes from. Mm. It's having a million half done things. Yeah, not even, doesn't come even close to having like three finished pieces. There's just something about, like, you can get, ni- the 90% is great, but the last 10%, it takes so much effort yeah. and thought, and to try to get it to work, that that's where you really start breaking your brain. Well, when you don't finish something, it lingers in, like, that quantum sketch stage, mm-hmm. where you, you don't lack, or you lack the confidence to feel like you can get it to where you need it to be, but it's unfinished, unfinished enough that you can still feel that it's like, yeah, it would, it would be sweet if I finished it, yeah. <laughs> If it kept going this way, it's going to be awesome. But, like, having three poor, or, like, lower quality, or, like, substandard drawings on your blog is better than having 20 unfinished what-if drawings on your hard drive. I think so. Yeah. Especially for a young artist. Like, if someone showed me what I was... Like, if, if, if I didn't... I think everything that I've ever done before I was, like, 25 doesn't exist anymore. And that's a good thing for me. Because I would be so terrified to see it, but we all had those stages. Like everybody starts at the bottom, and is is like just rough. Yeah. Art. Like every, yeah. everybody grows, and and that like I mean it sounds kind of cheesy and Pinteresty to say, but <laughs> it's like it's progress, not perfection. That's yeah. the goal. Yeah. And that would be great to put in uh, sticky letters on on your office wall here. I do that. Yeah. <laughs> every, every day I put up another one. It's, it's just it's everywhere. It's like the guy in uh, Dark City with all the spirals around his wall. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, I don't know. I think people are too easily discouraged. Yeah. That said, I do have right now on my computer some a piece of. Uh, Stranger Things fan art that I did that has been aborted. Oh, because I saw it. And that was just because I I had to stop halfway, and then the very next day I saw someone do my same concept but executed with so much more elegance and mm. so well that I was like, okay, well that's not needed anymore. Yeah, don't don't worry about that. No, yeah. so it happens. It's not like never let anything die. Oh yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's okay to just be like, yeah, you know, mm-hmm. maybe just for the best, but. Oh, okay. Actually, this might be a good a good point um, to answer this one particular question uh, that we got on Twitter. Um, we got them all here on this document. Oh, good. Okay. I think it was the first one that came in. But from Mike Ennick. Yeah. The blue color artist. Matt's style is flat colored but detail rich. <coughs> How does he decide on what to highlight and showcase? Okay. So, yeah. Flat colored, detail rich. I mean, hopefully this image kind of is a little bit of a departure from that because I was trying to copy Tom. Um, but doing all this line work is a good chance to talk about how, uh, and I've mentioned this before to people, um, but that my, the work that I do is kind of a, a, a byproduct of all the work that I've done at a video game studio. Um, so a lot of the work that I have to do has to be done very quickly and very clearly. Um, and it, and so it's, it's essentially like blueprints. Um, cause I, in the, in the past I would do drawings that, and, and we all do this sometimes where you do a drawing and there's a certain thing that you don't fully understand, you don't know what you're trying to say, but you do sort of a gesture or a squiggle, and that kind of does it. Okay, I get it. You move on. Yeah, Anyone can look at it. someone else it. figure that out. Exactly. But when you actually take that drawing and hit, put it in the hands of a model builder who then looks at you and says, what the heck is that? Yeah. I have to spend the next two weeks building that. I don't know what that is. It, 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 it holds you accountable. Yeah. So after years and years and years of that, I started getting very specific that if I'm going to draw a thing, I'm going to 
I want to take take that weight on myself and say, here is specifically what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. Now, if that can't be made in 3D, or if you have other ideas, knock yourself out. But at least here's something that is feasible. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of where it, it's just become kind of an expression of that. Yeah. There's, uh, what about um, like what when you decide on what to highlight and showcase? Like uh, to me, it. My guess for what you're doing is that it's intuitive largely because of just how used to doing this you are. But I think it seems like you usually draw a line when there's a uh, just a change in material. And you, yeah, it, it's a change in material and it's, it's kind of just, it, it's almost like trying to break the world down into the blueprint diagrams of what everything is. Yeah. Um, and, and thinking too about... Um, I, I feel like when trying to design a lot of stuff very quickly, the one thing that you can control the fastest and easiest with line is just the overall shape of a thing. Mm -hmm. And the shape to me is the most important element, graphic mm -hmm. design wise. And I like, uh, there's a, uh, uh, an ex-Disney animator and ex-ballerina -ballet named Samantha Youssef who does uh, figure drawing training now. Mm -hmm. And uh, talking to her in Montreal, it was cool. She said, I don't draw line, I draw form. And like all of her work is very line work. It's 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 lines, but it's like that's not what I'm drawing. I'm drawing form. I'm yeah. drawing volume. That's what I'm always saying. Is that you you just you're drawing a three D thing, a real thing, but you're just stuck in two D. Yeah. But for her, it makes me. She has, I mean, yeah. she's, she's saying something different, but it's it's neat to see that similar word. You're defining something. You're not drawing a line. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's and that's I, I say I I say a lot. Like I love line. I, I celebrate line. I think it's a it's a powerful tool. But it's a powerful tool because you can say so much about shape and volume with it without getting into the weeds of too much rendering. Yeah, okay. Uh, hopefully that uh, that works out for, for Mike there. Uh, now Blaze, previous week's winner, he's got three questions, or three tweets anyway, let's go through. So how do you deal with proportions, i.e. Azug has gorilla arms and you've posted dexterous characters with legs? Um, I imagine... I assume what he means is like, how do you tweak? Um, when do you know when to give long arms or long legs? Or yeah, how do you know when to like warp a body? Um, yeah, I mean it's it's largely just sort of obvious. Like if something's a monster, uh, <laughs> you start playing around <laughs> with stuff, and strong uh, long arms look strong, short arms look weak. Um, so because you, you wouldn't want to have like an orc with stubby arms that where the wrist ends at the belly button or something. That would be really hilarious, though. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, if I was making one that was supposed to be ugly and, like, not cool, mm -hmm. I would give it really short arms. Uh, but, um, or, like, like somebody dexterous. They need to look like... Basically, it, like they need to look like they can do what they do. Like, someone, <coughs> someone who's dexterous being lithe and strong at the same time, like a circus performer or a ballet... Dancer. Or a, a fun exercise would be to go and look up what average human proportions are, <clears throat> draw that out a bunch of times, and then start changing it up on your own and just seeing how it feels. What happens? Like, what happens? How does it feel when you make the head really big? What is that? What impression does that give you? What happens when you draw the legs? You know, twice as long as they as they normally should be. Mm -hmm. And how does that like? How does that make you interpret the the character? Mm -hmm. what, what do you get out of it? I was also wondering about ways for illustrators to easily identify magic. The blur in Matt Rhodes' art's cloak in Matt's art. Uh, Matt's cloak was interesting. I think the one that you last did for uh, for Clara. Uh, for Clara, <coughs> yeah, she had like that blurry dream wind. Cloak. Yeah, the wind cloak. Uh, as far as ways for illustrators to easily identify magic, I think it usually uh, it depends on the spell, of course. But typically, it's just like glowing stuff. Well. Yeah, I, I would say, okay, to me, not, not to get us into the weeds, but I would say that it should be an expression of the magic's role in the story, or, or, or the setting, or whatever it is. Like, if the magic is a part of your setting somehow, or a part of your story, um, wh how, what does it represent? Is it something dangerous and uh, captivating? Or is it whimsical and exciting? And there's all these different mm -hmm. things that you can say. Is it you know what? Does it does it make your character you know more desirable or more terrifying to people? Or, or yeah, is like it, is magic like a subtle and grim thing, or is it like a a fun adventure like popcorn movie thing? Um, I guess would be like so like 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 Peter Jackson just 
didn't show it, like when when like yeah. Sauron and Gandalf were fighting, you could just just see the effects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I think it it becomes an ex because it, it's in magic, like the visual representations of magic. It's an inherently it's an abstract kind of thing. So when it's abstract, I think just to me finding where it fits in the story and then try to make people feel that. Mm. Uh, also, this one's sort of more towards something I've mentioned, but uh, he's asking if I can talk more about the three color rule where whatever it is you want to express can be done in three colors. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something I've, I've said a few times where um, it's usually just talk to help people get underwhelmed with depicting an object or painting something yeah. where you can pretty much nail something of one material uh, with three colors. That's basically like the main highlight or like the main color of it, uh, mm -hmm. and the uh, the highlight and the shadow, basically. Yeah. Whether it's like, um, like high carbon steel, gold, ivory, uh, wood, uh, whatever it is, like you can, um, you can get it communicated that that way. Um, a lot of it is intuitive and just getting used to painting these sorts of things and then getting that as like a skill and a strength that you can develop but if you don't have that skill you could probably start off even by like when you start to color take a photo of an object that has the color that you like and then go into Photoshop and do like a median cut filter and that'll summarize the image into different segment large mm -hmm. chunks of color that where it's just a summation of everything and then pick them from that uh, that makes it a lot easier to start to see the relationship between those colors that you'll need. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, I mean, typically you'll, 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 you'll usually, like, you could do it with three, you'll probably end up with four or five when once you start adding, like, ambient lighting and, and like, refracted light and whatever, but uh, you'll be able to get anything done with, with minimal colors, usually yeah. around three or four. I, I still really think that uh, your lighting will, change, will do more for your image and, and, and things than local color will than what color a thing is. I mean, even on this guy, like, it, looking here, uh, just jump, to jump in for quick context on why he looks like he's made of Skittles. Yeah, um, speaking of color. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is a final color. No, I um, I just use a, a multi-fill plug-in. Um, it's the B-Pelt multi-fill uh, multi, uh, multi and... Uh, um, yeah, it, I can't it, remember what it's called. We, I'll, I'll send you a link to the website. It's really a, a handy tool. Um, so it just fills in any closed shapes, and then you can go in like this with the paint bucket and just do 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 do, you know, quickly color in. It saves you from redrawing the whole thing in color. Um, but a lot of what I'm doing here is just basically the same colors used over and over again. Um, if I need a white, I'll sample it from somewhere else that I have already. Um, even there, it's not because it, I know that at the end of the day, the, my my lighting is going to do way more to to say what color th things are going to be. So you're picking like, you mean like you're using one color and then you reuse it all over the place. Yeah. So um, like I don't know, even on the face there, I had an eye color, I had the color of the sclera, and it didn't. You know, I could pick another color for the teeth. That would be probably more accurate to do that, but. It works. It's so close, and I know that my lighting is going to do so much more to say what the eyes look like and what the teeth look like and, and all of that than mm -hmm. the actual local color will. Yeah, like how the light reacts to the surface. And yeah, yeah. That exactly. defines the material as much as any sort of color does. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is just going in and doing the duty of making sure everything is the, the right diffuse color. Mm -hmm. I didn't mention the, the, the circlet there. Um, the circlet is kind of goofy, but, um, Jacob's description was of a, he has a mind reading circlet mm. around his forehead. And, uh, and I just literally took, I made two little hands in that kind of like mesmerizing shape of like putting them to your temple mm. and like, with the uh, pinky and the four and the four index finger out. And then just they're, they're both holding onto a little crystal in the middle. Oh, that's cool. Um, so it's a really simple kind of shape, but it's like modern world like occult imagery yeah yeah it's like i'm reading fine, online yeah. but it, you know it's <clears throat> yeah, cool and you, you make using this uh 
coloring software looks so easy and fun. Well, and granted, when it's sped up to this speed, it looks even <laughs> it looks even more efficient. Yeah, like how how fast do you think that, <coughs> or how much do you think that speeds things up for you? Oh, it's it's so good just because it it really is. You're just going click 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 all the way through it, rather than tediously redrawing all of those shapes. Yeah, like a coloring book. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's not perfect. I mean, sometimes you go in and you have to fix stuff or or things like that, but it just really, really quick speeds things along. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I'll give you the link to put in the YouTube. Yeah, I'll put that. In, the link will be in the description uh, below this video. Yeah, um, you'll see it there. It's a useful plugin, especially if you're doing like comic books as well. Mm -hmm. As long as long as your line art is contained like Matt's, and and you, you draw deliberately so that you can use this. Oh yeah, I, I know I'm going to use it. It's, yeah, so when you, you're conscious, whenever you draw a shape that you need to know that you're going to color you. Yeah, basically, I'm, I'm never leaving open. open shapes. I'm closing all of the shapes mm -hmm. that I'm drawing. So what's the deal with this crow here? Uh, this is Merle. He okay, was Merle. picked up, I think, to perform the opera that they had to perform. Um, but he just was fond of it, and so now it's his constant companion. Cool. And what about the... Um, he's got these interlocking daggers or swords down his back. What, like, what? So in the description he has two sabers and what is described is he has one in his left hand and one in his right but the one in his right he, he, had, he carries facing down and the one in his left he carries facing up. So when he fights he has these two sabers like that. Mm. So I kind of thought if they're both if they're both handle up then one of them he's flipping out. I kind of like just the weird motif of having them be kind of mirrored mm. so that he reaches up with one hand down with the other and then when he pulls them out they're kind of in the right orientation. Yeah. And then he just has a, a very simple kind of like bog standard steel dagger and then a ornate handle dagger that is, I believe, a memento of his father. Um, so here, I've, I've explained this before in other things, but this is a bit more of a, I'm trying to do a, another detailed description of how I think through this. Um, so I have, and I'll try to or organize the layers here for you with color. So I have the diffuse color, which is just what the color actually is, you know, under pure white light conditions. Mm -hmm. And then I duplicate that and make a shadow layer and a light layer. And I just kind of change the curves and add some color to sort of say, okay, this one's a little bit brighter, adding a little bit of warm colors to it to say it's sunlight. And then in the shadow color, it's saying, okay, it's, you know, it's darker and it has a little bit of the um, ambient light from the sky and it takes on that blue. It takes on that blue, blue color. In this case, it was a little bit purpley. <laughs> and then uh, here, just doing a quick color sketch to show kind of how I want the color to roughly go. That'll be kind of my guide when I do it in more detail. Um, and then yeah, it really is just putting the layers on top and then masking them out. Um, so literally just painting the light right on there. Oh, There's so you do just that, that ultra quick little one. Just yeah. to like, so as you're going, it kind of reminds you like where to make the light be falling. Yeah. Okay. That's a, that's a neat, like that's a bit of a, that's like, to me that seems like an extra step. But it, it I go really, really quick with it. Yeah, so it's like not, it's worth the time because it's, it's worth the time because it, it, it it's really fast and it just helps me kind of remember just generally where I want the big shapes to be so that when I'm in there in the weeds going like okay here's some light on a fold on the scarf mm. I'm not getting so sucked into that uh, I always have kind of the bigger picture in mind mm -hmm. and that helps one thing that can trap me is if I like sit there and I'll like render an eye or or like some like in like particular detail. It'll look great, and then I'll zoom out, and it's just never going to work, and it mm -hmm. just looks bad. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a great way, like, this is a really good way to approach, like, a general to specific approach, where, like, you get the general area of light, uh, and then, and, like, you know where the light's going to be falling, but then as you work towards the final product, you, you're working on the more and more sub-details. Yeah, like the, yeah. The smaller details as you go. And to get that bit major ballpark thing, like in the little icon, like the grenades on his chest aren't aren't rendered or anything. No, no. But you know that when the time to when the light hits one, them, there will be little <coughs> shadows. Yeah, you're gonna them. do it yeah. there. Little shadows between the cards. I mean, they probably sit perfectly flat against each other, but for an illustration, you want to show some depth. Yeah, it'd be too sterile without it. Exactly. Yeah, that's a good way to like not get overwhelmed with like <coughs> rendering and lighting, which can be like. 
pretty intimidating for people. Well, it kind of gives me hope too, because this this stage here, um, this I, I still feel is not. It's not something I'm convinced is always really necessary. It's nice to get a final image, and that's great. Um, but I even when he's just at his diffuse color, that that to me feels like it's good enough to hand to somebody. Yeah. Like at that point, you can tell what color what colors and shapes things are. And that's enough to start building it. Yeah. When um, it's built in 3D, it will be rendered correctly. You know, e exactly. Like, well, yeah. he's got a human body. We'll just put this stuff around a body yeah. and make it look like that and then yeah. let the computer do the rest. Yeah. So that's why I say, like, uh, you know, it, it is still nice when you're trying to make an image. This this pass is... It's nice. It's appealing. It works. Mm -hmm. Um I've been feeling though, like uh, the rendering is something I need to get back into the ha into practice with a little bit, mm. even just for the sake of reminding myself how to render so that I can simplify better again. Mm -hmm. So I will probably start doing that. I've been watching tutorials <laughs> about <laughs> rendering and smoothing. I mean, even actually, even here, I was like trying to figure out how do I smooth this over, and I was getting frustrated. So, um, but yeah, I so I was awkwardly trying to paint it out looked up a few t tutorials on people doing rendering techniques and smoothing I found out Photoshop has some secretly really nice brushes for blurring things together hmm. so I come back later with that knowledge and well it's good to see the experimentation and the trying yeah like, that's yeah one, exactly that's one thing I like to show in these videos is like I make a lot of mistakes I make a lot yeah. of bad calls and yeah. it's it's better to like let people see that and that you go back and correct things or mm -hmm. even make mistakes. Too many people, I think, try to hide their mistakes, uh, yeah. or like you know, I mean, you know, it, it, you don't want any mistakes visible in a final product that somebody's paying you for. But yeah, I think there's 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 it's not like run amok, but it's it's around where like you meet people that are just like they they're divas about it. And they're, they would never want anybody to like know their secrets or know their flaws, uh, but but I, I I like learning that about people and seeing yeah. how human everybody is. And um, <clears throat> right here is a good chance to say too the the advantage of this technique <clears throat> that I found for myself is that I can still make adjustments to whatever the lighting layer is and the shadow layer. Yeah. So if I want all the brights to be brighter or if I want to change the contrast on them or something like that, I can still have some control over that. Yeah. And if you keep your masks intact, you can intact. You can just sort of paint more <laughs> shadows in, more light in, as you see fit. Yeah, it's a really malleable. And way it's to work. a, it's a. When you adjust it, it's a, it's a tide that rises all ships. Like everything will yep. be adjusted appropriately. Now, you, you, doing it this way, you don't have to go and find like, what's the, what color is the shirt when it's in shadow? What color are the pants when it's in shadow? What color is the skin? That's in yeah. It's all treated in the same global light source. Exactly. Yeah. So it's automatic. It's autom It's like pre-rendering for you. Now you just have yeah. to put the shadows in the right place. Yeah. But the color is all taken care of. Exactly. So anything about that cloak? I didn't actually read the description. Oh well. I did. I don't know anything about this character. I wanted to see just what you came up with. And yeah, what, for what sure. You could tell us. Uh, well, yeah. The, um, the cloak is just um, an elven cloak. Um, so it's it, there's not a particular backstory to it um, mm. that was given or anything like that, but it, it's kind of more just as a as an indicator of of his, it's his, his most, elven side. You notice it's his most outer layer as somebody who presents as an elf. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, I didn't want to get too elfy with it. it it's mm. a pretty simple cloak. I had a little bit of texture to the inside at one point and to the outside, just some um, yeah, something classy elf. Mm -hmm. A little bit of that touch of green. Getting into some details. Yeah, there's the little, uh, some highlights on that. Oh yeah, I can see the the hands now that I'm yeah. looking at. Yeah. yeah. So, what are your thoughts on rendering after doing this? It was it was good. It was um, it, the nice thing was I I gave myself uh, some some time. This is uh, it's deceptive. The, this was painted, drawn and painted over the course of maybe three or four nights, uh, just a few hours at a time here and there. Um, so just taking my time with it. Um, what, what I would do is I'd do a little bit of work, send myself the image, and then I'd look at it every now and then and just sort of get some thoughts and get some distance and stew on it for a little while. Yeah. Come back with some changes. 
I find if I have the luxury of doing that, it really helps. Mm. Definitely don't always have the luxury of doing that. Yeah, <laughs> it's a very rare thing to be able to sleep on it. But yeah. it helps a lot. Like It does. Taking a day, taking like an hour or two. Oh, here's a stupid little trick. Um, it's a This is a leather stud um, uh, outfit. Um, it's So it's leather stud armor. Uh, it's glamoured. And it has, it's meant to have a, a faint um, raven motif. I also added a bit of like the leaf veins for his elven side. Um, but for the studs, uh, oh, I'm gonna sneeze. <coughs> Excuse me. For the studs, <clears throat> I just make a whole bunch of little dots. And then in the layer effects, I add uh, an emboss kind of effect to it. Create the depth. So it basically makes these little 3D pointy studs. And then I add a, a drop shadow around it. Oh, so funny. it outlines it. So it's like making all these little rendered That's so shiny crazy. metal studs, but really, really fast. That's You're just so like, horrible. Doo, 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 doo. I know. <laughs> <That's> so <laughs> terrible. <laughs> oh, but um, so you definitely work. You're you're definitely working in a a, a high pressure system where like this is what you're willing well, to do. Like you got to get it done. And honestly, it's in a system where I know that the three D artists that I work with, they have the ability to have like a stud button that they can go around and they go boop and it imprints a stud onto a, onto a piece of armor. Yeah. So I'm basically doing what they're doing and they just need to know where it goes. Yeah. So, you know, and this is all it really ends up being is indicating, yep, here's where a stud goes, here's where a stud goes, here's it. Yeah, and in this case it, it works perfectly fine. Like they don't stick out, they don't like look weird and out of place because they're just small little details. And like being able to save time on all that rendering of each individual thing, uh, that does a lot. I've definitely pushed it too far in, in the past and used that technique to do like jewelry, like much more focal point jewelry or weapons or things like that, where mm. it just looks like Photoshop effect. Like it just is, it's very blatant. Yeah, like it can get super cheesy and too filtery and like plug in looking, like amateur. Yeah. And if you overdo it, but you gotta be sneaky. You gotta cross that line before you know it's there. So now, like doing rendering stuff and like volumetric stuff is really uncommon for you. Like you, yeah. I don't oh, yeah. remember the last time I ever saw you do it. <laughs> yeah, like since you're sort of like you were even sort of working on the fly with this, but like, do you have any like input or advice for people who aren't quite really used to doing rendering uh, or like rend like more more refined or like rendered stuff like this? Um, so I get like I get a lot of people asking me how to do painterly stuff, and for right. me it's weird because I could just do it one day. Um, like <laughs> my ex my expression or like the way I explain it is like I could do colored line art at home, but I couldn't at work. Mm -hmm. I could do painterly stuff at work, but I couldn't at home, and I and it it took me so long, like years of like trying and giving up of trying to do painterly stuff and like hmm. all like, rendered stuff, until one day at, at work. Uh, is a Bioware, and it, I was just drawing helmets, mm -hmm. and I realized that I had been actually been doing it all day, and it was because I was just worried about depicting the object, and not how to depict the object. Hmm. Like not, it, I I wasn't th consciously aware of how do I paint this painterly style. Mm -hmm. It was just how to like just make this look like metal and put the light where it goes, and, right. then, and then that was just all it took. But huh. and then like even like. But even like thinking about stuff in 3D and how light works or, or like wrapping your head around it. Like is there a trick, is there a mindset that helped you, is there a tutorial or a technique that helped you get towards your goal? Um, I would say after I, after I cough, <laughs> <coughs> excuse me, I have a four and a two year old at the record, time of the recording of this so I kind of catch just about everything that comes through. Um, I would say, as far as the rendering goes and how to how to approach it, uh, I have been doing a lot of life drawing lately at work, and uh, I've been trying to make it a point of of uh, indicating. I don't do fully rendered shots, but I indi I indicate it a lot. So I think a lot about what light does to a form and how to simplify it. Um, mm. It's one of those things that because because I know I'm trying to work fast, but I'm also trying to make stuff that makes sense and that's believable and that works. I ha I have to know what I'm doing. So even though I don't do a lot of personal work that's rendered and smooth and refined, a lot of my studies are about that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's something that's always on my mind. And even when I do a cel shaded thing, if you're going to make one line that separates two colors, 
you have to know about the form and where the light would fall in order to make that line yeah. meaningful. Um, but when it comes to rendering like at this level, I think it's just, I think it's just patience. It's just patience. It's, um, as I get older, I think this, the skill that I'm working on and developing now has been just that I just grueling my way through it, just slogging it. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, yeah, knowing that if I stop now, it's not done. Mm -hmm. So don't stop, just keep going. <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah, I think keep working it until you're done. Like I actually, even this, this is why I, I kind of still want to practice some of my rendering because I brought this image up to a point. I still had time to work on it, but I literally looking at it could not see anything to do. Mm. Like I actually ran myself into the wall and like, I, and I know there are painters who are much more skilled than I am who would look at this stuff and could see a million things to do. I mean, you know, the hilts on this, on the, on the sabers aren't very, they're just line work with some very simple shading on it. It's like, yeah, I could go in and figure out every detail there, but I reached that point where I was like, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, like it's something it you, works. It's like you have a spell on you, like you just can't see what could be done where someone else could step in and be like, uh, why didn't you include the subsurface scattering? Um, like stuff that would just be second nature to others to go in and like think of what to fix. Yeah. So I think that's probably also just a matter of practicing more in different veins of things like that. We'll, we'll, we'll see where it goes. Yeah. I've just I, I've also been seeing some very very talented very very talented artists who do kind of more stylized work uh, that have kind of a nice painterly smooth uh, treatment on their work that I'm finally starting to say hmm, that might be kind of fun just you know making characters that look like vinyl sculptures or yeah things like that like the, um, I I still am not a, even a little bit interested in realism. Um, like photorealism that I, I don't think I'll ever be yeah. interested in that. But what can be done as far as just making a beautiful image? I don't know, there's still lots to learn. Yeah. Here I'm just uh, adding some color to the line work. Um, it's just a cheap and dirty kind of way of adding a bit of variation and life to it. Um, but this, is, this would be one of those things where like, I wouldn't necessarily think to do that. But, right, right. But you know, but you do. Like, like you, you, you look at it and think like, yeah, I could still use some more sprucing up here and there. Let's add some color to the lines and. Right. I think colorized, colorized line. It actually is something I do. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but like, I, it's, it's that kind of thing. Yeah. It's such a good thing to do, and it's luscious. But it's that kind of thing. Yeah. It really cool. brings it to life. Yeah. It, it can be a bit tedious, but it, it's kind of one of those things that's worth it. Yeah, absolutely. It like even things like the shirt, like. If you were to click back and forth between the one with the colorized lines and the black lines, it would just the black lines become so oppressive. Yeah. Like once you've yeah. gone and done all this. Yeah, exactly. It helps communicate material so much more, especially mm -hmm. with line and with limited color palette. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, see, there's really simple texture on that cloak there. <coughs> now, what sort of Material would you describe that as? Or like, do you think that's like enough for a three D modeler? Uh, I think. Well, it, I guess it depends. It depends on what your relationship with that three D modeler is. <laughs> if you can, because <laughs> yes, yeah. um, there are some some people need some very specific information, and some people are are able to get it. I, I would say that says it's like a a fairly rough material, like a a thick fibered, I don't know, cotton kind of thing, like just a natural. Mm -hmm. Thing. So whatever the pattern really is, isn't that important? I think it just says that it's yeah, it's not silk. I mean, like know, it, it has a, a a more textural quality to it. Yeah, like even vagueness can just be it can just be you saying like yeah, whatever. Yeah, <laughs> just do whatever you want. Yeah, like exactly. it, it's obviously like a natural material, and it's like it's an outdoor rugged thing. So just yeah. just go hog hog wild on it. Mm -hmm. Here's concept art fish in a barrel rendering one oh one. Oh, it just rim like the shit out of it. It's such a good way to go. I, 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 I just, I've only started doing it, but like I wish that I had been doing it the whole time. It just really helps punch things up. It does. It does. There's no hiding from it. And you just you can never go back once you once you put it on. You just can't. You just can't do anything to get rid of it. Yep. 
rim lighting fungus. It is a neat jacket though, I like that texture of the jacket. I gotta say too, it, well, and I go in and add some stitching and stuff on it later, that, that, that tunic leather armor thing, it is, it's funny working in that area. In my head, it's kind of almost, almost bog standard rogue armor. Like it's, mm. you know, it, it's the kind of thing that, you know, no medieval person would make, but it kind of, for what fantasy settings have become, if you're a rogue, that's kind of like, yeah, yeah, see, there you go. Cool. I mean, it's like a lot of rogues probably have stuff like that. Yeah. Um, it's kind of vaguely ravenish, vaguely elven. It's a language that is understood. Yeah. Um, and that's a part of that's a part of designing fantasy characters, especially. That's fun. Is a little bit of surprise, a little bit of invention, but also there's a huge element of wish fulfillment to it. Yeah. That. I think is okay, and that I think is worth enjoying and celebrating. Mm -hmm. I think we might be getting close to the end here. This is kind of my last detail pass. Yeah, I'm kind of just rushing around doing... There's nine minutes left or something. Oh, is it? Oh, good, good, good. Okay. Oh, yeah, I guess at this point I thought, like, oh, we're getting close to the end. <laughs> a little progress. Oh, of course. Okay. Oh, we're not even close. Okay. But yeah, at this point, it's just kind of moving around and, and doing little <clears throat> touch-ups here and there and kind of just seeing, again, trying to find all those places where I feel like I can still find something to do. Mm-hmm. So some of it is, uh, okay, here's, here's where I go in and start rendering. Um, and, or, well, not rendering, smoothing. Uh, so I figured out from watching a tutorial that uh, there is uh, the mixer brush. If you go and click on, on the brush and go to the little uh, version that has the, the eyedropper on it, the mixer brush there, it's labeled. Uh, and you go check the list of possible mixer brushes. I was using, using the, uh, the cotton brush which is literally like your painting is now wet paint and you have a little cotton swab and you can just sort of blend whatever you've got. Mm. So that is how I blend, you know, smoothed over the line on the cheek there and did a little bit on the sleeve um, and just kind of found the opportunities where it was appropriate. Yeah, I want to try that out. I've always looked down my, my nose at blending and blurring, like in Photoshop and in real life. It just... It, to me, it always looked like one of those like plug-in cheap things, and it just looked bad. I know it's just like me just. I think you can. Yeah, yeah. It easily could, but like, it's one of those things where if if you do know what you're doing, it can it can look good. But I'd be curious to try it out, especially if I mean, if it speeds up your work without sacrificing the visual quality of it, then mm -hmm. uh, I think you should go for it. Yeah. yeah. What the hell is this? What's I just made a little stitch brush. That's a lot more efficient than what I do. Do you just actually draw the stitches? <laughs> I just draw it. Every, just do, 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 do. Yeah, I just go click, click, like. Oh tap, yeah, tap, no, tap, just tap, uh, tap, a little tap. rectangle. Just change the spacing up and. Uh, now, did you make that rectangle, or did you? Just no, that was one of the brushes thing? I have. Hmm. Well, I have to try I that just, out. It was just one of the ones that I normally use for something else. Just kind of like <clears> a, kind of a square brush. But yeah, I just angled it. It'd be good to have you do like a series of like shortcuts or like things like things that you've developed working in games for over a decade uh of, of like rapid fire production art i guess there are some things that i've come up with i still feel like my my photoshop <clears throat> abilities are very rudimentary oh mine are too like i i use very little of the of the software I've been using it for over half my life and i still kind of just stick to a very safe territory yeah well, that's fine, but but yeah, well, actually, one of the one it, you know maybe some of the stuff we could talk about that if we do that is uh, we we kind of skipped over it, but on the leather, just kind of rendering that kind of weirdy reflection quality, yeah, was just a lot of playing with um, the level opacity and how they kind of pass through each other. Mm. Um, oh, here, I, yeah. So there's a, like some blues and purples and things like that. There was a, a moment where they kind of pass through each other. That oh, this is nice too. Now that I, I, ha I keep the layers that have all of the colors and then also my diffuse layer. So here I just wanted to select the gloves really quick. But rather than lassoing around them, I could just go back to the diffuse mm. and just use the magic wand and select all of the Yeah, because the now they're gloves. like, now they're thousands of colors. But exactly. by keeping the original general color, you can just go back and grab the whole thing, no problem. Yeah, very, very quickly. So yeah, just mucking up with the contrast here, getting some... kind of just balancing everything against each other. One thing that might help you 
just mm-hmm. a heads up, is the adjustment layers, where it's uh, you can have, so it's like, like this symbol here with the black and white circle on, on layers at yep. the bottom. You use that, and it makes uh, <coughs> you can select like curves. Or oh, levels. I do. Yeah. Uh, and then oh. you just have it apply to the one layer, and then so like for like lights and everything, so you can, you can just adjust it at any time. You can apply it to just one layer. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, you can have it just set to the one I layer they below. Were universal, it. everything below it. Oh, I, mean, I thought that too, but once I learned that they were, you could just have it select the one secrets. layer below it. Secrets. Yeah, secrets, power, <laughs> unlimited cosmic power. So these boots look really cool. I would love to see a, a cosplayer try to try to make these. Yeah, here it, it was so easy to use that I just I I lost my stitch brush. I didn't even save it because it's just so easy to remake. Mm. And then just remade it for the boots. Very cool. And then since I had it, I just figured I'd put some <laughs> on the pants, too. Yeah, pants are a, a nightmare. I've, I've talked a lot about where it's like, if, if they just look too clean or too simple, then it yeah. doesn't look like fantasy anymore. Yeah. Oh, here it is. Okay. <laughs> I, knew, I knew there would be a long pause at some point because I, I forgot to stop recording. Oh, yeah. Because um, yeah. my, uh, my child climbed out of bed. <laughs> <laughs> it was running around upstairs, yeah. <laughs> so I had to go chase them down and tuck them back in. Yeah, so yeah, just very simple change of value on the pants, like a bunch of strips. Yeah, together. and as long as it doesn't contradict the character, you can do whatever you want with yeah. like mixing up like those pants. Yeah, just yeah. some texture. Yeah, you know, like he's a performer. He's extroverted. It makes sense that there's like some sort a of little weird bit of a flare. Fl- yeah, and a little, yeah. Good. I'm glad that reads. That was my thinking. It's one thing I wonder about with, like, especially rogues in D&D. Mm-hmm. Like, if people live in this world where there's rogues, mm-hmm. and rogues do rogue things, but all rogues dress like rogues, <laughs> uh, that's kind of a, a bad idea to be a rogue in, that looks like a rogue. In one of my favorite books, uh, Otherland by Tad Williams, uh, there's a, a fantasy role-playing world that's VR that people plug into. <laughs> And they go to have this meeting with these people at night. And in this town, there's like every shadow is just stuffed with people running around in black cloaks. <laughs> it's just like they're bumping into each other. And they're just like every single dark alley has like 10 guys in black cloaks sneaking around and shuffling. It's, it's, <laughs> and that's what I mean Everyone's about the wish fulfillment too. It's like it's the it's the wish fulfillment. It's it's uh, there are these archetypes that we love. Yeah, it's true. <clears throat> But yeah, it's it's true. I, and then a small side note: this is one detail that I kind of for well, like I, I was debating whether to put it in, but like I just added um, a little uh, the little wedding ring around his neck. Like I was thinking, his mom's wedding ring. Mm. Um, he, he loved her; she meant a lot to him. And after she died, thinking like you know a keepsake, but it's also something that his father gave to her, and he she she built him up a lot as his mind. Like he he didn't just leave and run off; like he had to leave for some reason. So there's still some respect there. So one little, one little tiny kind of keepsake con- connection to that. Yeah, cool. Thrown in there. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's an easy solution. Just putting a ring on a necklace. It's. It says a lot, but, but yeah, especially it, when know? it's like a fancy ring, because it's like, oh, who left exactly. this? It, so it makes just, somebody ask a question, yeah. whether they get an answer or not. Here I'm just kind of exploring through the layers again, just to see if there's anything I missed, or just sort of see how it builds up. The difference between them. Yeah, huh, I think now we're getting to the end. This is where I tried to copy your uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> your format for the end of the video. Nah, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's almost so there exactly is. there. LS. It's gonna snap in in like twenty seconds into okay. the actual one. That I didn't know that you actually put in this. Oh, okay. So it's gonna snap. Oh, will it? Uh, into my version. Oh, oh. It, but it's really close. But <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't well, know this was a really fun character to to, to draw. Yeah, I think it turned out really good. Really different from your first one, because you just sat there and banged that out in like two hours. And then and then this one, you, you spend a lot more Yeah, they do they're time different here. different techniques, different job. Oh, that's that's nicer. There we go. Clearly your signature and everything. It's nice to have that just to point people back. So this was Alice for Jacob by Matt Rhodes. Um, uh, and Thanks for letting me draw your character. Yeah, it was great. This was for the free weekly character art lottery where I uh, and sometimes Matt and other artists sometimes draw your original fantasy RPG pen and paper tabletop 
characters like D and D or stories that you've got that you've been working on and or whatever, just anything but video game characters. Because <laughs> video game players already have a visual representation of their characters, it's true. so they it's they're true. good. This is for people who have had their characters trapped in their imagination and they can't afford professional concept art otherwise. Can't bust them out of the mind jail. That's right. Get out of mind jail. Um, once again, follow me on Twitter, RND Fantasy, every week, Sunday, Monday. Thanks for watching, everybody. Hope it helped.